Thanks for tuning in. I know everybody's really busy and time is valuable. And hopefully you guys will get something out of this presentation that you can use to, uh, to make yourself and other people better. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit about me um, and us. And when I say us, I mean heart fit for duty. And for those of you that aren't familiar with it, we are a full medical practice that really focuses on primary care for public safety. So police, fire, EMS, military, that's kind of our whole world. And what that's allowed us to do is be really good at taking care of public safety and their needs, because you guys are special people. Um, you know, I, I jokingly sometimes say that, you know, like if we had a short bus for public safety, we'd all be on it because we're not like everybody else, meaning that we have shift work and stressors that aren't often encountered in other types of work. We also work directly with some departments and we do pre-employment AZ post physicals. We do pre-employment NFPA physicals and annual physicals for the fire departments. We do SWAT physicals. So we work with about 30 agencies in the state of Arizona. And then I'm also very fortunate that I get to do things all across the country. So I sit on some very large national committees and get to do work and education all across the US, uh, which is awesome. So we, we're very functional and holistically a wellness approach is, is really what we focus on. So we talk a lot about nutrition and today there's going to be some nutrition in my lecture, but we also spend a lot of time on prevention. So you're going to hear all of that from me. Why we do what we do is because in a 15 month time frame, there were four cardiac events of all healthy people. And I really started to wonder what's going on. Um, my husband is a firefighter and we have four kids of whom I only really kind of like one. So I had to try to figure out how to make sure that he stayed around and that I wasn't raising these kids by myself. So I really started looking into cardiac risk in the fire service and I was pretty blown away because I always thought as a wife that my husband would probably die either in a fire or in a motor vehicle related incident. He'd be on the side of the road and somebody would not be paying attention and hit him. I really didn't understand the cardiac implications in the fire service. And so I started looking into it and I was blown out of the water when I realized that cardiac fatalities are the leading cause of death in the fire service. And so I thought we ought to do something different. And then I realized that there is not a lot of education in medicine. And so I thought we really need to start focusing on different things. And so we kind of made a goal list and our goals were super simple. They were to keep, you know, public safety safe and protected, support both the individuals and the agencies and departments. We wanted to do some research and figure out how we could make statistics different. And we found out that education was a key component. And so I started working on education first. And then what grew out of that is this, is this full medical practice and, and the ability that we have to change lives um, every chance we get. And so we, we work really hard on that. One of the biggest things that I found out is that there's really three things that we have to focus our time and energy on. And they're getting better. Um, cardiac, we're still not great at. Cancer, we're doing a little bit better, and mental health has come a long way. You guys being here today kind of proves how much we're starting to address that and talk about it. Um, we know that these three are rampant in public safety, and really we need to come up with a plan and action items and how we're going to make a difference in these three endeavors. What we know is that 80% of your risk for cardiac disease and stroke is completely preventable. And when we hear that, when, when we can prevent 80% of anything, shouldn't we be all in? And the answer is yes, we absolutely should be. We should be focusing and having educational components every year about our cardiovascular risk factors and what we can do to change them. You know, the unfortunate part is that some of you guys will have a really healthy career, but statistically, you're going to survive five to seven years after retirement. And cardiac and stroke, along with cancer, are the leading causes of disease. And they're preventable. A lot of that is preventable, and we need to get on board. 
So everybody produces cholesterol. So some of that we can't predict and we also can't prevent. You're supposed to have it, it's healthy, you should have some. Now, some of the things that really play an important role are family history, what we eat, and how we move and how much we're moving. Now, you know, how much cholesterol you produce depends on those things, but how your body responds to it, they affect in a very big way. Now, we have built in protective mechanisms called HDLs. These H's stand for healthy. So they're high density lipoprotein, but they are your healthy cholesterol. And they have a very important job. They come into the body, they pick up all these bad cholesterols and they get them out to the liver for your liver to break down and process. And then your body uses some of them for fuel and energy and gets rid of a lot of them. If you have an effective transportation mechanism. Now your body has all different types of cholesterol. And you can see those there. We have some small little sticky ones. We have some nice big fluffy ones and we have some medium sized ones. Now, what type of cholesterol you have is really important. And this is kind of where that functional medicine aspect comes in. We need to know, are they sticky? Are they heavy? Are they big or are they little? Because if you have little tiny cholesterol and you have a healthy vesicle like down here, you're gonna be in pretty good shape. But if you have an inflammatory process happening in your vessels, and maybe your blood pressure is too high and you're not getting quality sleep, maybe you have stress at home or stress at work, maybe your sugars are elevated, then you start to have cracks in the integrity of that vessel. And your vessels are muscle, and their job is to get big and constrict. And that happens in response to stress. So if you're in a stressful situation, you're going to get small and constricted and your vessels are going to tighten up. And as soon as that stressor goes away, your vessels dilate and relax. Having a healthy vessel is very, very important. If you have cracks in your vessel, cholesterol will fall through. And instead of being transported by these nice, healthy cholesterols, they get trapped between two layers of muscle. And this is heart disease. And the bad news about this is if a doctor took a camera and looked down that vessel, he's not going to see this. It's called subclinical atherosclerosis or subclinical heart disease. And it's scary because we can't always see it. What we can see is this inflammation that's creating these cracks in this vessel. Identifying who's at risk and who has them is very important. And that takes quite a bit of work. And so some of you guys are, um, and I use the guys term loosely, so please forgive me if you're a lady on this, but you don't always disclose what's really going on with doctors because you don't trust anybody. And I get that. Doctors sometimes have a hidden agenda, but we really need to be honest about what's going on with our bodies and how we're really feeling because we have to be able to truly identify a risk. And you guys are healthy. You're, You're young. A lot of you look very healthy, but sometimes you have some stuff going on and we need to be able to find it and treat it and prevent those big cardiac events from happening. Now, metabolic syndrome is one of the key components. And these are the things that are really involved in metabolic syndrome. Excuse me. High triglycerides. Low, good cholesterol is a big one where you carry your weight. If you carry your weight around your belly, you have an increased risk. If you have abnormal blood sugars and if you have any high blood pressure. So these are all things that should be on your radar at all times. And you need to be aware of them when you go in to see a provider so that you can have that discussed and you can make sure that you're talking about them if you have them. Now, this is the fourth person. I said that there were four cardiac events in that 15-month time frame that really jump-started our program. And this is one of them. This was the only survivor in the group of four, and he happened to be the oldest. He was an ex-professional baseball player. He had zero medical problems. He didn't have high blood pressure. He didn't have high cholesterol. He didn't have a family history. He ate really healthy. He worked out on a regular basis and had his entire life because he was a professional athlete. He was at work one day and started having a weird feeling in his throat. And he really thought that it was because of his pre-workout. And so he went and he sat down 
he wasn't recovering well and he was really gray. His coworkers got pretty concerned. So they called and had him put on a monitor. And what they found out is that he was having a, a massive heart attack. And so they actually brought him into the hospital. I was an ER nurse for many years and worked at the hospital that they brought him into. So we took him straight up to the cath lab. And what we found when they took him up to the cath lab is it wasn't just one vessel or even two, but he had what we call triple vessel heart disease. All of his vessels were blocked at greater than 70%. Now this was the one we were the most worried about. And this is the vessel right here. And it's called the left anterior descending. The other name for it is the widow maker. So this was the widow maker before. And you can see a little bit of a shadow of where it was supposed to be. And this is afterward. Much healthier, happier heart on the right side after they put in the stent. And what the stent did is it opened up that vessel and allowed blood flow to get back to that muscle. Now what happens to muscle is if it loses blood flow and oxygen, muscles die. And that's what happens in heart attacks is one of your main vessels gets blocked and there's no oxygen that gets to this part of the muscle and that part of the muscle can die. Problem with widow makers is they're called that for a reason. And that is because most often people that have a blockage in that widow maker vessel do not survive. So it has a very high morbidity mortality rate. The bad news is, is in public safety, we see plaque buildup or blockages in that vessel about 55% more often than we do in the general population. And what we've been able to do with not just ourselves, but studies all across the, the world is take a look at some of the things that we see the most often. Those are chronic stress, sleep deprivation, and chronic high blood pressure. All of things that are treatable, manageable, if we are seeking healthcare to identify them. Now, this is that subclinical heart disease that I talked about. So this is a very health, healthy vessel wall right here. It's nice and narrow, it's a healthy muscle. And here we start to see it starting to break down. And that can be caused by a lot of things, stress, high sugars, high blood pressure, sleep deprivation, um, anything that causes that inflammatory response in the body. And then what happens is that vessel completely cracks and those cholesterols that we talked about earlier fall below that layer of muscle. And then eventually you're having a stressor and you have a skinny vessel because you're in a stress-related response. And then that vessel dilates. And when it dilates, this last little piece that's holding everything together ruptures. And you have what they call a blockage or an occlusive event. And that's when the body sees that as an injury and starts to put a um, kind of like a scab on it. And that scab actually blocks blood flow. And so that's what creates a heart attack. This inflammatory in the vessel wall is what we need to watch for. And that's why it's really important that you have a good healthcare provider in your primary care setting so that you see somebody regularly to make sure you're not having any of these issues. Now, why are you guys at, a, at greater risk? And part of it is things that we can't control. You know, if you're in, in the law enforcement realm or if you're in the firefighter realm, you can't, you can't control who you go see, when you go see them, what's happening, and any of those types of things. It's just all out of your control. And so we can't control noise. We can't control heat. We can't control that stress response to those calls. We can control dehydration. <clears throat> we can control dietary patterns. We can control some of the mental health aspects, but we need your help. And, and you guys have to be the ones that are cognizant of it. We can talk about it till we're blue in the face, but you guys have to start implementing some behaviors to change that. Now, the bad news is, is that cortisol, which I circled for you guys, is a stress response hormone. And that's a really big deal. And you guys have chronically elevated levels of that. And so being able to identify those, those, Behaviors that drive that cortisol level high is important because if cortisol way up here can, takes resources away from everything down here, we have a problem. So I want you to think of these like bills. You get paid, you start paying your bills, you get to cortisol. 
cortisol says, hey, you're not working out, you're not eating good, you're not sleeping good, you're fighting with your spouse all the time, we need $800. And you look at your bank account and you only have 1,000. And you say, cortisol, if I give you $800, that's gonna leave $200 for all of this. Now your sex binding hormones are right here. People think that that's just sex. It's sex, it's intimacy, it's sleep, and it's coping. And if you are, you are not making these because cortisol takes $800 and then your kidney and liver call and say, hey, we're your vital organs. We're taking everything that's left. You are never going to have any resources to help produce and keep those sex binding hormones at the right level. So now your coping mechanisms start going down. And that's where everything starts to drive you crazy and you're really irritable and you don't want to go anywhere and you're tired all the time and you just want to watch TV or play video games and you don't want to interact with people. Part of that is your sex binding hormones. Now, one of the solutions for a lot of our people is to go straight out and get on hormone replacement. Not always the best answer. We got to figure out why it's happening. Because it, once you go on hormone replacements, all of your body's natural production of these stops. And we haven't dealt with the problem. So you're still going to have issues. They're just going to look like other things. So we have to get to the root of the problem. The other issue is that elevation in cortisol causes elevation in blood pressure, elevations in blood sugar. It causes increase in heart rate, increase in breathing, breathing, increase in blood sugars. And so now we've got those metabolic syndrome that causes heart disease and stroke activated again because of our stress response. So we have to be really cognizant of what is making those hormones fire at such high levels and figure out how we need to start managing them. Also, those increases in that heart rate and increase in that stress response starts to change the function and the look of your heart. So your heart's a pump, it's a big reservoir and its job is to hold blood and push it out. And right now it should be pushing water out. And it's like drinking water through a straw, super easy, right? Blood pressure goes up. And now my hoses go from being nice big hoses to being skinny hoses. And the skinnier the hose, the higher the blood pressure, the harder I have to push. So think about going from a nice big QT straw to a little coffee stirrer. So you have to suck a lot harder to get things through that coffee stirrer. Now, if your blood sugar goes up, now you're trying to suck up a milkshake through a coffee stirrer and it's really hard. So now your pump has to start pushing really hard. And what happens is that reservoir starts to change. And instead of being nice and big, like this ventricle over here, it gets very narrow because that muscle starts working harder. And what happens to muscles when we work them? They get bigger. And when muscles get bigger, they can't push as much fluid. And so it starts to change. So you have to be very careful. Blood pressure is a big one. High blood pressure is the leading cause of left ventricular hypertrophy or abnormal cardiac wall thickness in science. So it's treatable, it's manageable. And people say all the time, well, I don't wanna go on a blood pressure pill. I get it. But if it can save you from being in congestive heart failure when you're older and retired, we need to do the work, at least until we can find out why our blood pressure is high. Is it high because of our diet? Is it high because of our weight? Is it high because of our sleep? All of those things contribute. Next one you see is sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a big deal and we got to get it treated. You need to have a sleep study if you snore so that they can identify how to help manage that. If you have a heart attack and you have sleep apnea, your risk of having a fatal event increases by 33%. So you won't survive it and it's treatable and manageable. And people think you have to have that CPAP mask. And a lot of doctors, and in fact, a lot of dentists have started treating sleep apnea very effectively with an appliance. So it doesn't even take that Darth Vader mask. And I get it. I don't wanna sleep next to Darth Vader. And I know you guys don't wanna be Darth Vader, but I also would like for my spouse to survive. So sometimes we gotta take the good with the bad. Left ventricular hypertrophy, that thickened heart muscle, we see that in patients that have obesity, that have hypervigilance, 
or that inability to turn off that stress response, sleep deprivation, and heart murmurs. Now, heart murmurs are due to the valve. In your heart, you have a valve, and that valve is made of muscle. So if you have good muscle integrity, that valve is going to stay closed all the time. As we age, our muscles start to decrease their ability to stay closed. And that blood kind of flows through that little bit of an opening and creates a heart murmur. An echocardiogram is an ultrasound of your heart that you can go in and have it done. And we really recommend you have it done every three years if you have a murmur or an inefficient heart valve. And that's just making sure that your body isn't compensating by having to push harder. So it's very important that you get those checked. Now we did a big study and it, we looked at firefighters um, as they get annual physicals every year. Law enforcement, it's a little bit harder to do, to do research on because you guys aren't, you don't have to go to the doctor every year, but we did a large study and this was um, four different states. We took a look at firefighters, both male and female. And this was really, really interesting. Of course, the older you are, your blood pressure goes up, but look at this dramatic difference. And we didn't break it down by 30 to 40 and 40 to 50, but 50, once you hit 50, and trust me, I'm there, um, at, um, two thirds of all firefighters had uh, elevation in blood pressure. And so it's something we really need to be cognizant of. But even in the 20 to 29 year old males, we found 45% had hypertension or high blood pressure. So definitely something to be concerned about. Now, blood pressure categories have changed. And the crazy thing is, is, you know, I was an EMT before I was a nurse and I've been a nurse for well over 20 years. And so I was an EMT before that. So I've been looking at blood pressures for a heck of a long time. And the one thing that I found out that's so crazy is that we used to consider 80 a normal blood pressure. And now that's hypertension stage one, because we've learned so much. And what we've learned is that we can't let you get to 80 and we can't let you get to 130. We need you to live down in these normal ranges. And a lot of people don't even know what their blood pressures are. And it's important that we start taking a look at that and that we uh, see what blood pressures are so we can figure out how to manage them. These are some of the big ones that happen when you have high blood pressure and we don't want any of them. And we definitely don't want any of them as we age, right? Because maybe some young people have strokes and they do really well, but people over the age of 60, when they have strokes, typically don't do very well. And living without our kidneys isn't great. Heart failure, you can't hike, your feet get swollen, you can't breathe well. You know, vision changes, I would love to see my grandkids age. So it's really important. And of course, we don't want anything happening to our nether regions. Very important that we keep those functioning. Medicine's broken. Um, doctors are seeing way too many patients because they're not making any money to talk about prevention and wellness. Doctors make money the sicker you are. So they don't have a very vested interest in getting you healthy and keeping you there. You know, if you're a diabetic with high blood pressure, I can see you four times a year and I make money every time you come in. So what is my... What is my motivating factor when I see your blood sugars increasing to tell you, you got to get your shit together and we got to decrease your blood sugars and your blood pressure because you're going to be sick. There's not a lot of motion, motivation in that. The other thing is you guys don't use your healthcare benefits. And I just thought I would put this in here. Um, in 2020, the CEO of Blue Cross, oh, sorry, the CEO of Blue Cross and Blue Shield made 11.5 million dollars and that is because they get a percentage of all of the money that's paid into the insurance programs that isn't utilized and so i just want you to keep that in mind you pay for benefits every paycheck but how many of you really go see your doctor every year in a prevention model you get a free wellness exam even if you have a high deductible plan it is free free they will see you for free and they will draw blood for free. Is it the best blood panel? No. Do you want to add stuff to it? Absolutely. But you still get a lot of it for free and people don't take advantage of it. 
We did, um, we actually pulled all of our firefighters that come in for an annual medical and we do about 2000 a year. And we found that 8% when we started were seeing their primary care doctor. After we worked on it for years, we are now up to 27%, <laughs> but I'll take it. We gotta start somewhere. So please go see your doctor. Um, obesity, we don't think about police officers and firefighters as being overweight, but you guys are. Eight out of 10 of you are overweight and the obesity numbers are high and we gotta, we gotta manage that. High waist circumference and high weight drives blood pressure, which drives heart size. And we gotta prevent that. It's very important that we do that. Um, the higher your weight is and the more you, you actually gain, the higher it is that you're gonna have a work-related injury and be off your regular duty. And so for every BMI unit increase, we see an increase of disability or injury. Lifestyle habits are big. You, we're just not moving enough. Um, I, you know, Some people did really good during COVID and some people did really bad during COVID, but movement needs to be part of your every day. And even if you can't get to the gym, walk. You got to start somewhere. Eating habits. Diet is super important. And my next portion is all going to be on nutrition. Binge drinking, um, tobacco, big ones. Um, in fact, there's a, a study that's about to be published. And I actually saw a preview of it last week at a conference about how much alcohol is being consumed in public safety. And it's pretty mind blowing. And some cancers increase by 30 to 60%. The, with uh, daily drinkers. So when you were looking at ways to mitigate disease, alcohol is a big deal. Poor sleep habits. Uh, you guys are top of the line for that. When you, you're overachievers anyway, you're really, really overachievers at poor sleep habits. And part of that is due to shift work. And part of that is due to, um, we just don't give ourselves a lot of time. We are givers and we're a hundred percenters. And so we give 100% of our time to other people for other things. So sometimes we got to put our name back on the list and put it way up at the top. Obesity, um, oh, this is the slide, as much as 30 to 80%. So musculoskeletal injuries go up and so does uh, cancers. So we got to be really careful with that. BMI drives heart size. I kind of just talked about that. Those thin walls are found in in people that are normal weight and those thickened walls, much higher likelihood of finding those when somebody has an elevated BMI or not just BMI, waist circumference is actually tight as much because BMI might be off due to muscle mass. Um, and so it's, it's waist circumference. Now, this is not the only picture of health. And I, I, you know, things that we need to keep in mind, you can be really thin and still have high blood sugars and high cholesterol. So um, very important. Somebody just raised their hand. How do I see that? I don't know how to see who raised their hand. So sorry. I will get to questions at the end. So um, if, if, we'll if get you that, have, go ahead. We'll get that situated for you, Kepper, so that way you could see it afterwards when you're done. Okay, perfect. Thanks. So does what we eat matter? How big of a role does diet play? And diet plays a huge role. In fact, what you eat is about 60% of your risk for cardiovascular disease and stroke. So when we talk about when we talk about that, what we put in our mouth every day matters. And I teach at the police academy and I always say, you know, what you eat today directly ties into how you feel in retirement. And it's nuts when you're 22 to think that the meal that you have for lunch could directly affect your stroke rate, heart, heart disease rate, and cancer rate. But it is 100% accurate. These are the obesity trends in the United States. We started tracking them in about 1990. By 1995, all the states were reporting. And as you can see, we had three colors. Not horrible, not great you know, greater than 50% of the country is over 15% um, obese. So then we start looking here, we had to add three new colors, doesn't say much for us at all. Um, 
And, and as you can see, the majority of the states, there's only four states that are less than 20. Estimation is that by 2035, we will be greater than 50% obese as a country. And actually we are exceeding that because the numbers for 2020, thank you, coronavirus and the pandemic, um, those numbers were above 40%. So they are really estimating that we will hit the 50% mark in the next five years which is really scary because what happens with obesity is that diabetes mirrors it. So if you just look at the relationship, they go hand in hand and people say, oh, well, diabetes runs in my family. Um, type two diabetes is not genetically transferred. You're not genetically predisposed to have type two diabetes. Now, type two diabetes runs in your families because nobody runs in your families. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's because we're eating what we, what we learned growing up. So it's, it's like what we see in patterns of abuse. They're very cyclic, right? If the parents were abused as children, they're much more likely to abuse their children. If there was alcohol and drugs in the household, then the children are much more likely to have drug and alcohol problems. And we see the same thing with bad food. If you grew up eating a certain food, you are much more likely to have diabetes if your parents had it. And so we've got to just completely change that. And it's really hard because I all the time patients will come in and they're like, well, I want to eat what I want to eat. I go, okay, great. But how many people do you have watching you? I have four kids and I have six grandkids. So in my mind, I have 10 people watching and their spouses, everything that I do. And so it's really, and now I have a nation, honestly, people don't even want to eat with me, but I have a nation watching what we do. And so we have to be good examples. And the only way to do that is to change what we eat. Diabetes is a problem. And a lot of people think it's just a sugar problem. Oh, so if I eat sugary foods and I drink soda, then I'm going to be at risk for diabetes. And, and I really want you to completely change that mindset because it's a, it's a sugar problem, but it's a carbohydrate problem. And so if your foods don't have multiple things going for them, you need to look for protein, you need to look for fat, and you need to look for carbs, okay? So if it doesn't have protein, it doesn't have fat, guess what it is? So I want you to think of a potato. My pancreas and my stomach talk. I eat a food and my pancreas says, okay, I have to get these sugars from the bloodstream into the cell. When they get into the cell is when they become energy and fuel. When they sit in the bloodstream, they're just kind of dangerous because they piss off the blood vessels and they make them inflamed and angry and they create cracks, which is where the cholesterol hides. So I don't want them in the bloodstream, I want them in the cell. And so the way that that happens is I eat a potato. My stomach calls my pancreas and says, hey, Kepra ate a potato, she needs a hundred trucks. And I need you to send those trucks to come and pick up, those are insulin, send your insulin trucks to pick up this sugar and transport it to the cell. And then my insulin says, whew, okay, well, a potato has no protein and it has no fats. It's all sugar. You need a hundred trucks, but I'm old. Okay. I'm going to be 52. I only have 30 trucks I can send you. So now I've got 70 sugars that are sitting everywhere in the bloodstream and they're making my blood thick. And my body says, I'm not going to pump that thick, heavy syrup. Instead, I'm going to store them and I'm going to store them in fat for later. So that if I ever go three days without eating, I can break into those fat stores and get fed. Bad news is we never go three days without eating, right? I mean, I've already eaten twice today and it's only 1.30. So it's 1.30. I'm in Montana. It's 1.30 in Montana. So it's 12.30 there and you guys have eaten, right? And so we never go into those phases where we empty out those, those storage cells. So our body sends any extra sugar into fat. And then what happens is eventually we can't keep up with the workload. We're eating more carbohydrates and sugars than we have trucks to pick them up and transport them. And so it shuts down our ability to use sugars the way that we're supposed to. Now we can see diabetes happening for about 10 years before it happens. And that phase is called insulin resistance. And it's really important that we take a look at what that looks like. So we eat food, 
We make insulin. The insulin tries to transport into the cells. The cells won't take it. Body stores it as fat. Then we're sleepy. We get a headache. We get cranky. We need some a pop of energy. So we eat food or we drink a sugary drink and that cycle just starts all over again. And so it happens for 10 years. But if you go see your doctor and they do some blood work, we can actually see it happening and start changing the foods. Or you can change your foods now before you go see somebody. Eat real food. What does that mean? Well, honestly, it shouldn't live on your shelf. You know, when food was made 50 years ago, it, bread didn't last for a month. Bread lasted for about a week and then it got moldy and you had to throw it away. And the reason is, is because there's no yucky stuff in it, no food stabilizing fats, which are triglycerides, which are very inflammatory for the body. So if it lives on a shelf and doesn't go bad in a week or 10 days, you shouldn't make it your primary fuel source. It's just not healthy. Track your food. How many of you know how many grams of protein you eat every day? How many grams of carbohydrates? How many grams of fiber? How many grams of fat? That is base level knowledge. You know what kind of fuel you put in your car. You know what kind of oil you put in your car. You need to know that much information about your body. You get one body to last hopefully 80 or 85 years. You can go buy a new car when yours breaks. We can't do that with our bodies. Limit processed simple carbohydrates. If you're eating carbohydrates, they have to include fiber. And that's the difference between brown rice and white rice. That's the difference between broccoli and a banana. A banana has no fiber, it's all sugar. A medium ripe banana has the same amount of sugar as a Mountain Dew. And people eat bananas like they're the best thing in the world. And I, it drives me crazy. Some fruit brings stuff to the table. It's got lots of vitamins and nutrients and fiber. Banana has a little bit of nutrients. It has potassium. People always say, well, I need the potassium. There's more potassium in an avocado than there is in a banana. Skip sugary drinks, any of them. I don't care what they are. They're going to lead to a spike in your sugar. Your body's going to try to move all that sugar out with insulin. You're going to dump and you're going to get tired and cranky and irritable and probably a headache. So drink water. And I know you live in Arizona, some of you, and I know you need the, the sodium and stuff found in Gatorade. I call BS. Not true. If you're eating a healthy diet, you don't need those, those extras. Liquid IV, great idea. Some of the options you should be eating. Non-starchy, leafy greens. They should be in every meal. People are like, well, I don't want to eat vegetables for breakfast. Okay. It's totally up to you. You can use food as medicine or you can use medicine as medicine later. You pick. And I, you don't have to eat them every day, but if you can eat them 80% of the time, we're going to make huge headway. Protein, very important. Now I put meats, I don't care if it's red meat, chicken, um, pork, fish, all of it. They're all proteins and proteins are super important. Proteins are building blocks for your muscles, your tendons, and your ligaments. So when we look at movement, and especially movement as we age, we need all three of these to work really well together. Muscles, tendons, and ligaments help us move, and those are all fed by protein. Healthy fats, almonds, walnuts, pecans, pistachios, avocados, macadamia nuts, those are very, very important. Those fake fats that are in a lot of the oils that are out there are not good for you. Olive oil, coconut oil, and butter. That's the only thing you need to be using. Oh, you can use um, avocado. You can use um, macadamia nut oil. Those oils are okay, but you don't need any other oils in your house. Get rid of them. Oily fish. The oilier the fish, the better. So the fishier the flavor. So salmon has about 1,600 omega-3s. Fresh albacore tuna has about 800. Mild white fish and catfish and cod have about 300. So when you're looking at bang for your buck, the fishier the flavor, sardines, salmon, those have a higher fat content and they're much better for you. Layering your meals, proteins, um, complex carbohydrates, fats, those are really great. Jerky, almonds, 
um, Greek yogurt. Those are what we should be building those snacks out of and layer them. Don't eat a carbohydrate by itself. So if you're going to have a banana, don't eat a banana alone. Eat it with peanut butter or um, put it in a protein shake. If you're going to have an apple, make sure you pair it with a protein or a fat. In Europe, when they bring out fruit, they bring out nuts, they bring out olives, they bring out cheese, and they bring out meat. And they do that because it balances the equation. Eggs, meat, great source of energy. They have lots of B vitamins in them. And in fact, a lot of times people say, oh, I had to have that boost of energy towards the end of my shift. So I went in and I grabbed you know, a, a sweet snack. And I want you to keep in mind that um, protein sources have more v B vitamins than any sugary snack ever will. These are some options that are portable that you guys can get at any of the convenience stores around the Valley. And they're great. Premier protein shakes you can buy at, at um, Costco's and Sam's Clubs and any of those big box stores. You can even get them at Walgreens. So if you have a 24 hour Walgreens and you don't have a convenience store, you can run in and get them. Uh, 30 grams of protein, three grams of carbs, and they don't have to be refrigerated. You could buy a box, keep them in your locker and take two of them on shift, pour them over a cup of ice and you got 30 grams of protein. These are 30 grams of protein. These also do not have to be refrigerated. They are amazing. My kids love them. We drink them daily at our house. Uh, my kids don't love to eat breakfast. And so they take a Fairlife protein shake with them to school and it works out really great. Um, almonds, you can buy all flavors. They have spicy, they have wasabi soy, um, they have smoked, they have everything and they sell them. They're two bucks. People are like, oh, it's so expensive to eat healthy. Uh, two bucks, not bad, right? And a much better option. Lots of protein bars out there. Just make sure you're reading the labels. Jerky's great. Um, you know, we're, we're on a road trip driving around seeing cool things and we have all of these in our car right now. Something to think about. When we're talking about mood and mental health, we always focus on, well, we don't always focus on any of it, but we talk a lot about um, brain chemistry. But 90% of your serotonin, which is your mood regulators, are produced in your gut. So if your gut is not healthy, it's gonna be almost impossible for you to have steady moods. You're gonna have mood fluctuations because your gut is unhealthy and 90% of your serotonin is produced in your gut. So if you have good levels, you're going to see good moods. Um, you're not going to crave things. You're not going to be super cranky. You're going to have better sleep and you're going to have better pain tolerance. And when you have low levels, you're going to see aggressive behaviors. You're going to be cranky. Um, you're not going to be able to, to compensate for these and you're going to have temperature regulation issues. So something very interesting to look at. Sugar kills gut flora. And if you're eating sugar, any of these names, um, some of the big ones that I hear that, oh, people are like, oh, it's agave, it's natural, um, it's honey. And just so you know, honey is bee vomit, which is super gross <laughs> and also still is a sugar. So just keep that in mind. Great ways that you can eat out and still eat healthy. Um, just get rid of some of the extras. So bread is always extra. Uh, bread, that the way that they serve it in restaurants is not healthy bread. It doesn't have any of the good fats. It's made with a lot of those bad oils um, and it's all processed flour. So if you can get rid of the wrapper, whether it be a bun, whether it be a tortilla, just take them away if you can. And then that way you can have maybe, um, you know, rice or some healthier option, some quinoa, something along those lines. So just get rid of all the wrappers. Use a fork for your food or your fingers. Read labels, very, very important. People don't read labels. They don't know how many servings are in things. And this is a perfect example. This is Naked Juice. It's the green machine, it's supposed to be the healthy one. Um, it's four containers in this serving or four servings in this container. Serving size is eight ounces. And every serving has 33 grams of sugar. And you have to multiply that by four if you drink the whole thing. So this is basically sugar for breakfast. So if you're doing the Naked Juice Green Machine, you're drinking 33 grams of sugar and only getting two grams of protein. So keep that in mind. Energy drinks, 
horrible for you. They cause an abnormal blood pressure response. Um, and if you pair them with alcohol, you are my worst nightmare. Um, alcohol and energy drinks cause your blood pressure to spike. And whether your body would normally just process it out, it spikes and it stays elevated and we can't bring it down even with medicine. So please be very, very careful. It causes extreme dehydration. Energy drinks are a dehydrant, alcohol is a dehydrant. When you pair them together, you get a, just this significant concomitant effect and it's really, really bad. The other one are pre-workouts. And I just want you to read the names. C4, Ripped, Havoc, Inno Explode, um, Explosion Ripped. I mean, they all cause injury. <laughs> Why would we think that they're good for you? People are like, oh, I need my skin to tingle when I work out. Well, um, drink some coffee, go with some espresso. Um, espresso is actually a natural caffeine, so is coffee. Your body breaks it down and can, can help get through it much faster than any of these abnormal um, algorithms. They call them proprietary blends. And basically that's meth. So just keep that in mind. What people are eating, mean carbohydrate intake in the United States um, for both men and women hovers right about, uh, the average is 50, 49%, which is ridiculous. Um, mean protein, and remember protein's a building box for our tendons, our ligaments, and our muscles. And our average protein intake is about 15.5%. That's a problem. And then fat intake, they did not, they did not quantify good fat versus bad fat. And with the amount of Burger Kings and McDonald's, I am assuming that this leads a little bit more towards the bad fat. And it's right around um, 33%. So kind of scary numbers. What should we do? We should focus on cardiovascular, cancer, behavioral health. You guys being here is the first step. But I really want you to think about what are your training modules in your department focused on? Do you guys talk about cardiovascular health? Do we talk about cancer and cancer prevention? Because I teach nationally and most of the classes, it is the first class that's ever been taught. So if you need help with that, please let me know. Happy to help however we can, um, but it's important and we need to get it on the radar. People need to be talking about this regularly. Exercise, super important. Uh, you can cut your risk of colon cancer by as much as 40%. If you exercise moderately, so super, super important. You can get a lot of benefits and just walking is a great way to start. I don't expect you to run to work every day or ride your bike. Just walk, begin with something simple. Um, what can I do to protect myself and my family? Because remember, you have a legacy and what do you want it to be? Uh, don't bring dirty crap home. That's a big one. When we start talking about cancer prevention, Keeping your work clothes at work is really important. Shower, um, may eat and maintain a healthy diet, nutrition, sleep, stress, identify those big ones and keep them on your radar. Make sure you go see a healthcare provider. Uh, I really encourage you to purchase healthcare and pay as much attention to finding a doctor as you do to buying a car. Most people find a doctor by going to their health insurance website and typing in their zip code and calling. And that's total garbage. You need to call them and say, hey, as a new patient, how long do I get with my doctor or nurse practitioner? The other big one out there is I should only see a doctor. Not true. Nurse practitioners are very education-based and education-focused, and you'll actually sometimes get a better visit with a nurse practitioner. That's all I hire because nurses are trained as educators and they're trained to help educate patients. And that's what we need is education. But doctors you need to see regularly, dermatology, primary care, and have a mental health counselor that you're comfortable with and familiar with that you can use if you need them. What kind of education should you have within your department? Um, discouraging tobacco use, talking about binge eating and, and excessive drinking, promoting health and wellness fitness programs, talking about nutrition, talking about the importance of maintaining a healthy weight. You know, when people are calling and needing bigger duty clothes, we need to start talking about it. Taking a look at stress and then figuring out plans for resiliency and how to be more resilient. 
but you guys have to make a commitment. You have to decide it's important and you have to come up with strategies to address it within your own family, within your, within your, maybe your unit or your, your crew, and then within your department. And then it needs to come all, we need to come at it from all sides. Hey, do you have resources? Do we know what our internal resources are? How can we build our resources? What does that look like? And we need to focus on all five of these things. You guys are amazing people. You deserve to bankrupt the pension system. But the reason that we still have good pensions is because most people don't survive to use them. And we need to change that. We need to make it different. And the way to do it is to be educated. And not just about your needs as an individual, your needs for your family, and your needs for your department. Thanks for listening. I see that there's lots of questions. So I'm gonna start taking a look at them and trying to uh, answer them as I go. Okay, naturally produce high amounts of bad cholesterol due to family history, genetics, um, eat right, exercise, calcium shows, clear arteries. So you're right, you do need to constantly be monitoring. A calcium score is super inexpensive in Arizona. Um, my Massachusetts guys, pay 400 and some odd dollars and my Arizona guys pay 70. So there's a huge discrepancy nationwide about the cost of it. It's usually not covered by insurance, but it is a great way to look and see if you have any buildup in your coronary arteries. And what it does is it's a CAT scan that takes a look at calcium built up in the arteries. And the reason that calcium gets built up in the arteries is because if you have cholesterol that's in there, your body sees that as something bad and puts a protective coating on it. And that protective coating is calcium and we can see it through the CAT scan. So it is important to have it done. The other thing about cholesterol is people think, oh, I produce too much. So that's a problem. You can also hold on to too much and it's called the hyperabsorption. And there's a blood test that'll tell you if you're a hyper producer, a hyper absorber, or if you're both. And there are me certain mechanisms that we can put into play to, to stop that from happening. Um, waist circumference, great question. Your primary care doctor should always have a tape measure. They cost 63 cents at the medical supply company and they should check, it, check your waist circumference every visit. It's total crap if they don't. It's, it's a shortcut, it's an easy way out. And in fact, when you're, when you're interviewing physicians, that's a great question to ask. Do you do a waist circumference? And if they don't, kick them to the curb. The other thing is if you don't have a good doctor, they're not getting 50% of your retirement if you would divorce them. So get rid of them, find a new doctor. Food for medicine, it's a true story. Um, olive oil, sorry, that was my timer to make sure I didn't go over. Olive oil, coconut oil, butter. Those are the only things that you should be cooking with. You should not be cooking with vegetable oil, canola oil, grapeseed oil. If you have an avocado oil, that's okay. Um, macadamia oil, almond oil, any of those nut oils that are actually healthy oils, those work pretty good. Creatine, um, that's kind of one of those things that uh, science isn't 100% convinced is great for you. If you have completely normal kidney function and you use an appropriate creatine supplement, you might be in good shape. But for most people, creatine is not the best, the best workout booster. I know if you read those, those um, bro science articles, or if you read the labels, they say that they're great for you, but it's not always needed. You can get a lot of that out of other types of things. Um, let's see. Um, just... Diet should be high ratio of perishable foods, but the good protein suggestions or healthy snacks all have a long shelf life. So you're right. That is kind of interesting. And thanks for bringing that up, Pam. I am looking at 80% of what you're eating being things that don't live on the shelf and that they have, you know, their, their regular protein that has to be cooked and they are vegetables. Now, for those of you that are on shift work, instead of driving through McDonald's or one of your 24 hour 
open places that, you know, has fried foods or really poor quality foods, I'd much rather you do jerky or a protein bar or a protein shake. And that, but that's not going to be all the time, right? I really want you to start building your lunchbox and taking those foods with you and being prepared for what you're going to see throughout your shift. Those are just some ideas for things that you would have to supplement with if you couldn't get access to those better um, products. Um, thoughts on intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is amazing. It has a lot of positives. It's not sustainable for everybody. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's great. We use it all the time. We treat a lot of our diabetics with intermittent fasting. We treat a lot of our patients with inflammatory processes with intermittent fasting because it's a great reset for your body. I fast. I've been doing it for years. I fast almost every single day. Um, and I do it between about a 16 hour fast and it works great for me. Is it for everybody? No. Is it something you need to be educated about? Absolutely. And I, I really encourage people to look up every type of eating before they, they start it. So intermittent fasting, ketogenic diets, paleo diets, low inflammatory diets, we need to be educated about what we need as individuals and the internet has given us a wealth of knowledge. And I really encourage you guys to start looking at that before you go with any type of product. Um, I will put the sugar slide back up. Absolutely. Um, supplements. So supplements are a moneymaker for a lot of people. So you have to be really cognizant of what type of supplements you need. Most people pee out over 50% of their vitamins because they just don't need them. So when you go meet with your provider, it's really important that you take a list of everything that they recommend. And they should be looking at ways besides medicine to treat you. The other thing is if you go to a doctor and they put you on a pill, they should give you a list of homework to try to get you off of it. One of the few pills that that does are medications that that doesn't make sense for is thyroid. We can't do a lot of repair work with the thyroid through diet, but cholesterol, um, diabetes, so many of those medications don't need to be lifelong. If you do homework, but they need to tell you what the homework is and they need to tell you what you need to do with it. Um, so my diet Pepsi addict, uh, soda is horrible for you. I was a diet Dr. Pepper addict for many, many years. And my husband would tell me all the time, you're killing yourself, you're killing yourself, you need to stop. And it's crazy. The minute I stopped, so many things got better. Um, it's just not good for you. Now, is having a diet soda every once in a while okay? Yes, for sure. Mexican food and iced tea don't always go together. Sometimes you just need a Diet Coke, right? And I totally get that, but you just need to be conscientious of, of the health effects that soda causes because there's a lot of them. Um, switch to tea if you can. Um, tea has a ton of health benefits and you can get it everywhere you get soda. Peanut oils are garbage. Please stay away from them. Palm oil, garbage, peanut oil, garbage. Not great for you. Um, juicing is tough. Juicing pulls all the fiber out and leaves all the sugars in. So um, if you're juicing, you need to be getting other things elsewhere. So you need to eat a very high fiber diet and you need to be very conscientious of the amount of sugar that's in the items you're juicing and, and try to balance that. Make sure your protein and fat intake is high and that your sugars aren't being the highest. When people drink juicing or juice, a lot of their foods, they end up with a high sugar diet most often. Um, D3 supplements are very important. You have to pair them with a the fat. D3 is fat soluble and only crosses into the membrane and gets used and in, into the cell if it's paired with a fat. So if you're taking an omega-3 or a krill oil, make sure you pair your D3 with those because that's how they work together. Um, K is the other one. K also helps your body uh, utilize vitamin D. So it's really important. Um, ashwagandha is amazing. 
any of the mushroom family, lion's mane, ashwagandha, those are all really, really great for you. And turmeric is wonderful. Uh, I take it every day. It's a very potent anti-inflammatory. It's natural. It's very good for gut bacteria and microbiome health. So it's a very good one as well. Vitamin D3 needs to be managed by a primary care doctor. So those levels need to be checked at least once a year if you're on a vitamin D supplementation. Um, high blood pressure meds and dehydrants. Uh, yes, they do dehydrate. There are some that are much better than others. Um, and so you have, to, you have to make sure that you don't, well, I shouldn't say that. You need to talk with your doctor to make sure that you don't end up with a, a medication that's gonna cause higher blood pressure or higher dehydration than necessary. So that's a really good point. Um, Plant-based lifestyles, there are a lot of people that can maintain that. Um, we tend to find that they're a little bit low in protein and so they have some more injuries and they don't recover as well from significant disease processes. And in fact, there's some studies that are going on right now that are talking about chemotherapy, um, people that don't do as well during chemotherapy treatment or cancer treatment, radiation as well, if they are just plant-based. There's a lot of things to be said about plant-based. I don't care what you eat, as long as you're eating quality protein and vegetables. Um, I do not want you eating processed carbs. And a lot of um, vegetarians eat a lot of crackers and pastas. So you have to be really careful with that. Um, beehives. <laughs> Um, natural honey isn't horrible, um, but it, it is bee vomit. And I kind of talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, I, you know, it's still a sugar. If you have in insulin resistance or any inflammatory processes, those sugars are still going to cause a problem. So it has to be really, um, watched fatty liver disease is awful. Your body stores extra cholesterol and extra sugar in your liver and in your fat cells. And so if you have any of those extras floating around, you have to be really careful. So um, really quick, I'm going to answer the last question. We take most insurances. So if you're interested in being seen at the office, you can go to our website and it's www.heartfitforduty.org. And there's a get tested form. You can also call the office. Um, we do see primary care patients. We have a very large primary care practice and we're happy to help. If you guys have questions or if you have an interest in, in doing some education for your department, please just reach out and let me know. Um, I'm happy to help any way that we can. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you doing this. Um, it's, it's time that we put some priority on health and wellness. So thank you so much for doing this.